I'm Ben Davidson for Gold Derby here with Margaret Brown, director of the documentary Descendant on Netflix. And Margaret, your film follows descendants of the survivors from the Clotilda, the last ship that carried enslaved Africans to the United States. And it takes place in Africatown, also known as Plateau, Alabama, a few miles outside of Mobile. And it's a story that's really been kept sort of a secret um, to most of the country and about these Africans brought to the United States after the slave trade was illegal. Why do you think this story has gone untold for so long? Well, it was a um, it was something that you could be lynched for telling the story. Like people were the people in the community were told to keep it in their family, keep passing it down because it's an important family story, but it's also a dangerous story. And so, yeah, people were told to keep quiet for over 100 years. And how did you become aware of the town that's so many residents of that um, ship are still residents of? Well, I'm from Mobile, which is like um, Africa Town is part of Mobile. Um, and 15 years ago, I made a film called Order of Myths that was about segregated Mardi Gras in Mobile. And um, back then, my mom told me um, the white Mardi Gras queen, her name was Helen Mayer. And the Mayer family is the family that brought the Clotilda, the last slave ship to the United States. And back then, 15 years ago, my mom kind of said to me, well, you know, like that family is the family that brought that ship. And I didn't know, I hadn't learned that in school. Um, and and I, I didn't know that that would necessarily even be part of the story I was telling in that film 15 years ago. But then, um, you know, Mardi Gras has a white Mardi Gras and a black Mardi Gras. And um, after Mardi Gras was over, I was filming with the black Mardi Gras queen, Stephanie Lucas and her grandparents. And um, her grandfather, that we were talking about a ball that um, both the white and black Mardi Gras had attended, which was highly unusual. And um, the grandfather just sort of casually said, oh, my people are from her people's ship, meaning Helen Mayer and meaning he was descended from the Clotilda and the people that were carried over on the Clotilda. And I kind of looked at the cinematographer and he looked at me and we were just like, it's one of those moments in documentary where the ground like shifts under your feet. And, um, and then the film kind of came centered around the Clotilda and the story of that ship in a way and these two Queens and how they were connected. And so, yeah, I kind of ran into the story 15 years ago and um, it, it started back then, but we, um, Kern Jackson, who's a character in, um, in Descendant, he was the historical advisor for Order of Myths. And he's the um, head of African-American studies at the University of South Alabama. And he's a folklorist kind of in the tradition of Zora Neale Hurston. And we kind of never stopped talking about it. So even though I didn't start making the film until almost five years ago, it was like always percolating. And while you were making the film, were you expecting them to recover pieces of the ship? Or was that, again, one of those moments where you're no. like, wow. I mean, because that really makes it, a, takes it from folklore to real. Right. Um, so what was that like? What was that moment like for you? Well, we started filming um, like two years before the ship was verified as the Clotilda. And the way that started was I started hearing um, like five years ago that they'd found a ship and they thought it was the Clotilda and like the whole international press descended upon Mobile and people were contacting me who, you know, had a bit, had, had seen order of myths from my hometown, just like, are you coming back? And I, I, I was not planning on coming back. Um, but just, I was, yeah, I was, I was sort of like, you know, eventually like I was kind of convinced by a producer who literally wrote me a check and put me on a plane, but that's not really what you're asking. But yeah, we started filming two years beforehand because the ship that the community called the no tilde because it was ended up not being the Clotilda, um, they, they did discover that ship. And I knew that I had something that no one else had to tell the story, which Helen Mayer had been in my other movie and um, the white Mardi Gras queen. So I knew that like, and, and that family was not talking to anybody, not the New York Times, not the Guardian, you know, they weren't they weren't talking to any of, of the press outlets that were all descending on Mobile. So I thought, well, they'll talk to me, you know, this white family, but they ended up not talking to me. Um, but yeah, that's sort of another part of how the film unfolds. But um, yeah, well, it turns out when these kind of bigger things that are at stake, when there's a ship and, like actual physical proof, maybe the rules change, but they never spoke to me. Why don't they speak? You know what? You I have mean, to ask is, them. Is there, I mean, yeah. because they, they, they still reside in the area, correct? 
Yes. And they also have certain companies that are polluting the area that led to higher cancer rates. I mean, there the effect has been felt on Africa Town that goes beyond just the Clotilda, and you touch on that as well. Well, I will say one thing. Since the movie came out on Netflix, they came forward on the Today Show and made a statement. So um, they have now said, and I, I can't quote it verbatim, but it's basically like, we want to listen. We want to talk to the descendants. We want to be better. We understand we've behaved badly in the past, um, but we want to we want to listen and we want to get involved. So that did happen after the film came out. And can you talk briefly about Zora Neale Hurston and who she was and what she meant to this film? Because that archival footage that you pull for this is pretty amazing. Um, yeah, so almost 100 years ago, Zora Neale Hurston went to Mobile and she um, she filmed and also recorded the voice of Cujo Lewis, the last known survivor of the slave ship Clotilda and also like until really recently thought of as like the last living slave. Um, and, and so, um, so, sh so she recorded him and wrote it into a book called Barracoon. And, um, and that book became like part of the text of the film. The book came out only in 2019, which is sort of um, a little bit after we started filming. And I read the book and I read her letters and I just kind of became completely obsessed with her. Um, and she was sort of like the guiding light of the film in a way, because I knew that I wanted to, to have um, descendants of Cujo reading from that book because they like Cujo talks about Timothy Mayer in the book. He talks about how they really wanted land, how they really like they how they yearned for home, how he cried yearning for home. And it was just very emotional and also completely connected to like not that many generations later of descendants who still lived in the area. And um, and also the area that is like sort of surrounded by in industry industry and like oil tankers and you know sort of hazardous waste dumps and all these things that um, you know the mayor family leased the land to industrial companies. And what was the most challenging thing for you as a filmmaker just throughout this whole process? There's two things. I mean, one of the most obvious thing is COVID. Like um, there's a lot of elders, black elders in my film that are really powerful voices passing down the story that they've gotten really good at telling for, I mean, when you pass down a story for 160 years, I think you get good at telling that story. Um, but I would say the hardest thing was my whiteness. Like I started the film thinking that, you know, I had this thing, this white family that no one else could get access to, but then I ended up not getting access to them. And actually a lot of white families in Mobile, you know, I made this film Order of Myths, which is sort of an anthropological look of, at whiteness in part. Um, it's, uh, you know, that, that's that's how I thought of it. In, in addition to like sort of looking at like constructs of whiteness and blackness around Mardi Gras, you know, um, after that film came out, a lot of white families, I don't think wanted to talk to me when they heard I was like doing sort of a, a spiritual sequel, I guess, um, to that film. So it ended up being a film about very much about black storytelling and like the black experience. And I didn't feel like I was necessarily like, I have so many blind spots as a white person. And, you know, when I, cause this, the film changed, like when you start a film, you think it's going to be one thing and then it's not that thing. And I, and two years in when I'm like, Oh my God, I don't think these white families are not just the mayors. Like a lot of white families are going to talk to me. Um, I was like, what am I going to do? You know? Um, and luckily, like I had some things in place, like I already had Kern as a collaborator I had a you know, very diverse crew, obviously. Um, but, um, I brought on a producer before that, but she was kind of unofficially involved. And then she kind of became officially involved Essie Chambers to sort of, you know, we're friends really more than like, work collaborators and we sort of just started talking about it naturally because I was just like you know I want the film to be for everybody not just for white people so you have to think creatively about how to do that um because that, that's the situation I found myself in so yeah whiteness was the challenge but I think you know with with just deep listening to other people and like you know feeling like well I think this is the right there's all these little things you would think maybe are little things in the film but that I didn't see because I was white. And, and I think like, it took like, you know, all my collaborators being like, no, to make this for everybody, like you have to, 
you can't you can't put that little thing in and i can talk about that more but i feel like i'm talking a lot no it's fascinating um one of the most moving things for me was just seeing the members of the community gather together especially when the the recreation of that ship was unveiled and just the emotional reaction that that had on the community um now that that is there there's plans to sort of memorialize that maybe have a museum where does that stand right now in terms of you know getting people to come in and see this history yeah, well, I mean, that's a really complicated question that I don't think I can do justice too quickly, but there's a there's a there's a temporary museum happening, which will still remain there, but might they might morph and move it into a bigger museum called the Heritage House that's almost complete right now. Because of COVID, some of the supplies were like hard to find, so it's not completely done, but that's about to be ready. And that'll have um that'll have like i don't know i don't know yet because this is this is an ongoing story i should say like this you know i made the movie but the story continues like there's still things happening the ship is still being excavated we still don't know like where the ship is going to live is it going to stay in the site is it going to be moved to like josephine allen which is the site that a project used to be in that's now this big open field that would be community adjacent but not like directly in like historic africa town um, I think a lot of the community, which is not just one monolithic voice, but of course, lots of activists who want sort of different things, like having a very healthy conversation about what's the best place for the Clotilda. Is it where Josephine Allen was? Is it in the community? Is it, you know, in the in the Delta still, like preserved in a way where people can visit it, go from Africa Town out there and view it? So this is an active discussion that's happening right now. And um, the film kind of ends in this like sort of, I don't know, spoiler alert, I guess, but it ends in a moment where it can go either way. Like the city can sort of lift up the voices that have been in the community for generations, or it can be extractive and um, decide to, you know, co-opt all that money that's going to come from the tourism that's going to be generated. And a lot of the community doesn't want tourism directly in the community. They want it. They want a community free from pollution and no tourism, move the tourism somewhere kind of close by where they can still like be the curators of that tourism, but not in their own backyard. Well, it's an incredible story and everyone can go check it out now on Netflix and Margaret Brown, congratulations on your work. Good luck with everything moving forward. Thank you.